Welcome. My name is Brian Kniff. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm here tonight to welcome you to our very first Ignatian Values in Action lecture. Before we get started, I want to make just a couple of quick organizational announcements. Uh, the first is for our special audience today, the first year students. If you did not do so on your way in, please swipe your royal card on the way out. As you know, this is a passport event for the College of Arts and Sciences and for the Kenyus School of Management and a tapestry event for Panuska College of Professional Studies. So your deans are watching you and tracking your movements uh, and make sure you swipe so you're accounted for. Second, I'd like to remind you that tonight at 8 o'clock we have discussions organized of tattoos on the heart and tonight's lecture. Uh, and these discussions will be including two of our special guests here tonight. Uh, you'll find these discussions on the fifth floor of Brennan Hall at 8 o'clock, so please continue the evening there. Okay, that's enough organization now for our major event. I hope you're excited. Are you excited? Because you really should be. Uh, that's my job, to tell you when you should be excited, and this is one of those times. Uh, as a way of introducing tonight's featured speaker, I'd just like to say a few words about why we're here tonight. And I want to speak particularly to our first-year students. Just three weeks ago, you gathered right here in the Byron for your first convocation as University of Scranton students as the class of 2016. You were suddenly at that moment keenly aware that you are members of this very special community in Jesuit higher education. We were confident that you understood that because we made you wear t-shirts that told you that was true. You looked real good in them too. Just a week and a half later, many of you gathered here for the Mass of the Holy Spirit our campus community's most important celebration of the start of the academic year. You know, we do these things. We, we, we pull the basketball nets and the backboards up, and we kind of put all these chairs on the floor of the Byron, and our, our maintenance staff fantastically arranges this place for us. And, you know, here in this gym, we have a sacred place. So by now, three weeks into your university education, you have a pretty good idea of why we come together in this very special place and in this sacred place. As a campus community with shared values and shared commitments. In other words, you've already moved past the t-shirt stage. And that is very seriously our main purpose in instituting this annual lecture. To continue our newest students' introduction to the university's mission and identity. Particularly through the example and through the words of people who live these values, day after day, often in difficult and magnificent ways. Now, one of the most interesting things about my assignment here tonight is that one of our featured speakers, Father Greg Boyle, does not really need to be introduced to you, of all people. Many of you already know Father Greg, at least through the magic of YouTube, from his moving address a year and a half ago when he came here to our campus to receive the Pedro Arupe SJ Award. Named after the great superior general of the Society of Jesus from 1965 to 1983, who so powerfully formulated our understanding of what it means to educate men and women for others, this award is our university's highest honor for distinguished contributions to Ignatian Mission and Ministries. Many of you know Father Greg's work from the testimony of your fellow University of Scranton students, at least three groups of whom have traveled in the past year to Los Angeles to visit Homeboy Industries. And there are other groups planning to go, so you can, you can get in line for those projects. Tracing its roots to the Jobs for a Future campaign and the church-based communities Dolores Mission in the late 1980s, 
Homeboy Industries now includes Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen and Embroidery, Homeboy and Homegirl Merchandise, Homeboy Diner, Homeboy Farmers Markets, Homeboy Grocery, Homegirl Cafe and Catering, a solar panel installation training and certification program, and mental health, substance abuse, and domestic violence services. By now, you as University of Scranton students understand very well while so many of our students travel across the country to learn firsthand about Homeboy Industries' mission of providing hope, training, and support to gang-involved and recently incarcerated men and women. And, of course, you all know Father Greg from Tattoos on the Heart, the focus of this year's Royal Reads program. Through this wonderful book, he has already contributed mightily to your education in one of the most important gifts of the Ignatian imagination, the ability to extend the circle of compassion and kinship until we imagine no one standing outside that circle. Now, as good students that you are, you've probably already recognized that I have begun to quote the eloquent words of a man who is actually sitting right behind me, waiting to speak for himself. So, it seems inevitable that he is here with us tonight for this very special night in the life of our university. And it seems inevitable, too, that he has brought with him a couple of special guests from Homeboy Industries, Marcus Avery and Edward Rodriguez, who are also going to speak to you tonight. So please join me in a University of Scranton welcome for our three featured guests. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Edward Rodriguez. Um, I'm here representing Homeboy Industries, of course. I'm going to tell you a little story about myself. I come from um, Los Angeles, California. I grew up in a two-parent two household at first. I have an older sister also. Um, when I was very young, uh, my, I, my father was a drug dealer, a big-time drug dealer. My mom, she's been working her job for like 34 years. Um, but one day, my dad ended up getting killed in a police raid, a uh, shootout with the police, uh, as a result of his occupation. After that, um, my mother, she became a, a real heavy alcoholic. So growing up, she was like real uh, verbally abusive, um, physically abusive. Um, I used to get whipped with various different things, from vacuum attachments to she used to put rice on towels and make me stand on my knees and face the corner You know, when I get in trouble just all type of stuff. So uh, growing up, I used to always act out um, around the house in the neighborhood. Uh, I would just get in a lot of trouble. So as time progressed and progressed, I be began to hang around gangs and commit crimes and it only got worse. I started experimenting with drugs and, you know, just trying to be in the in crowd. Um, when I was about 17 years old, I ended up getting uh, incarcerated for a robbery. Um, Due to committing that crime, I was sentenced to 12 years with 85% in state prison. Um, during my time in prison, I was still getting in a lot of trouble. The first few years, I was still bitter until I was bitter from, for getting locked up and missing out on a lot of stuff. But um, over time, I just realized like what I was doing was, wasn't going to do nothing but lead me to the same thing when I got out. I just ended up right back in prison, so I started trying to change my life, so I began um, you know, getting my high school diploma, uh, taking college courses in there and various different trades and, you know, reading different books and just doing a lot of soul searching. So uh, b by the time I turned 28, I paroled and um, I was just looking for an opportunity and, you know, try to do something positive. Uh, a friend of mine that I was incarcerated with, he told me about Homeboy Industries and I went down there and I checked it out and I ended up becoming employed there. Um, Right now, what I do at Homeboy Industries is um, I work in the employment services department, so pretty much we help people like find jobs outside of Homeboys and all that, but most of the, most of my most important job at Homeboys is that I work on myself. So, you know, at Homeboys, I have a, a you know, a therapist to talk to, you know, about different things, you know, uh, in my past, present, whatever, get stuff off my chest. Um, you know, I have 
a tutor that, you know, helps me with my college work when I need help and all that stuff. So that's pretty much our objective uh, at Homeboy Industries is just helping people get to where they need to be and become uh, productive members in society. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Scranton University, for having me. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Marcus Avery. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Marcus, and I like to share my story. I started off a young boy, an older sibling, um, both of my parents in my life. Up until the age I was around nine years old when my pops was killed. Um, he died from a drug deal going bad. Um, not only that, when before he passed away, he was very uh, abusive towards my mom. So after that, I start hanging around the wrong crowd, um, ditching, ditching, ditching school. Um, I had cousins, family members that was in gangs. Um, I was surrounded by gangs, so that's, that's all I really saw and, and knew at the time. Um, I started being from a gang when I was 12 years old. Um, me and a, a friend of mine, we was hanging out one day and just like kids that go to the playground to, to swing, we, was, we just decided to be from a gang. Um, I've never been in trouble as a juvenile, never been to juvenile halls, camp, anything. Um, up until I was 19 years old, I was incarcerated for a robbery. Um, I hopped in, I got into a gentleman's car who just committed various crimes and the police obtained a vehicle with my fingerprints in the car, and I ended up getting eight years with two strikes. Um, I was released from prison in 2010. When I was released from prison, I made a decision that I need to put the gang life behind me because of the things I was doing to my family, the ones that, that loved me. Because when I was in prison, the friends that I thought was my friends wasn't my friends no more. Um, I was basically a forgotten person. So when I was released from prison, um, I made an oath to do good for my mom, my brother, also my little daughter that I have. Um, the first step I was taking was to get my gang tattoos removed. Um, I did research on a lot of places that does tattoo removal, but I don't know if anybody know tattoo removal is very expensive. So um, my, my brother, he, he, his friend suggested me to go to Homeboy Industries and that they do them for free. Couldn't believe it, but I told myself I, I should give it a shot walked through the doors of Homeboy Industries and I seen people that not only I was incarcerated with, but I never knew that they wanted to change their life around as just like I wanted to. Um, I started my treatment last year. I've been getting treatments to get my tattoos removed over a year now. Um, around a few months after I started my first treatment, um, I applied and asked Homeboy Industries to give me a second chance so I could be a productive um, human being in the communities and contribute. Um, they hired me. Um, I, I enrolled in a GED program at Homeboy Industries. 
as well as several other programs, parenting class. Um, I also did anger management class. Um, I started off on a maintenance crew and now I'm in charge of running uh, Chips and Salsa. I supervise young gentlemen and young women and I take them all across Southern California and do samples of Homeboy Industries Chips and Salsa. Um, it's, a, it's a good experience for me because it not only helps me with my people skills, but it also helps me build a resume and keeps me out of trouble and keeps me not from going back into that younger life that I once was in. Um, I also can provide for myself, my daughter, my mother, and people who love me. Um, this is just a start for me. It's, it's, it's a good experience that a place like Homeboys is there for people who really want to change for themselves. I wasn't forced to walk through them doors. I wanted to. So I'll, I'll share with you my story. And with that said, I would like to welcome to the stage our founder, executive director, Father Greg Bull. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I am closer to God than Marcus Avery and Edward Rodriguez. Un aplauso one more time for the two of them. Thank you for your um, hospitality uh, shown to the three of us. Uh, I, I feel badly because some of you have heard me before, maybe, uh, you know, the, the, I was here last spring, I guess, for the Arupe uh, Award. And uh, I'll move over here, is that better? And, um, and then YouTube, I just heard about YouTube. So, uh, so it happens, I, I always feel badly if people have heard uh, me before. Uh, once I was at a foster grandparent gathering, a huge gathering in Southern California, it was their um, annual gathering. Well, I had spoken at it the summer before. I don't know why they invited me two summers in a row. And uh, afterwards, this grandmother, I think she liked the talk. She had big tears in her eyes and she grabbed both my hands and, and she said, I heard you last year. It never gets better. So kind, kind, kind of hoping she misspoke there, uh, <laughs> though not entirely sure. Thank you for your attention, uh, even though you were forced in here and forced to read my book. But you know, folks on the margins just want a little bit of attention. I, I had a very earnest gang member, 16 years old, walk into my office and stand in front of my desk and he says, look, I need your divided attention, I said. You are so in luck, because that's exactly what you'll be getting. Uh, you know, there's a vision that brings you to uh, this uh, uh, place, not only this institution of higher learning and a place soaked with Jesuit values, uh, but it's, it's a vision of wanting the world to look differently than it currently looks. Uh, you, you sense that from, uh, I did anyway, from the the three groups uh, that came to uh, Homeboy from this place. Um, they just want the world to, to be altered and shaken from its current course. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, it presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But you don't want to wait uh, con los brazos cruzados. Um, you don't want to wait uh, for something to happen. You want to make something happen. And as I've said uh, before and on YouTube, um, is you want to uh, create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. 
A Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? And so to that end, what we do in our own particularity is we stand at the edges of the margins of that circle with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. We stand with those whose dignity has been denied. We stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Every once in a while you get very blessed and fortunate and privileged to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. I don't think that's my call. I think that's our call as human beings. And I suspect that if kinship was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would, in fact, be celebrating it. So for 25 years, I've been so privileged uh, to be taught so many valuable things, really, by homies and homegirls uh, over this last quarter of a century. But the last two years, I'm so grateful to the homies because they've taught me how to text. And um, I am just so grateful. It uh, sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm pretty good at it. Um, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW. And, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. And I've been using that one quite a bit lately. And so there I am in a car with two homies, and we meet as the day begins at 9 o'clock at Homeboy. And there are two homies who work for me, Boncho and Manuel. And we're going to drive to a high school to speak. And they're going to help me give the talk. And uh, so uh, we're 15 minutes on the road. And Manuel, who's in the front seat, gets an incoming. And he reads it. And he kind of chuckles to himself. And I said, well, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, Snoopy, I'd just seen him. Snoopy gave me a big abrazo as the day began. And Snoopy and Manuel worked together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers. It's a big job. And uh, I'd just seen him. And, and so I said, well, what's he say? Oh, gosh, it's dumb. Hang on a second. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing. And, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? For there's an idea that's taken root in the world. It's at the root of all that's wrong with it. And the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. How do we stand against that idea? You know, one of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend. And I remember once a reporter had commented to him and said, uh, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and he said, the feeling's mutual. Which is the hope that we enter into this exquisite mutuality with folks on the margins. You will be engaged in service during your time here, as you have been, I presume, even before you got here. And service is a good thing. Service is the hallway that leads to the ballroom, but you want to get to the ballroom, which is the place of kinship and mutuality. Because there is even a distance in service. You know, um, 
at Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and these folks are in need of my exquisite healing. It's mutual. We all are a cry for help. We all are in need of that kind of healing. It's not about service provider, service recipient. There's even a distance there that we want to bridge if we can. I remember there was a homie named Caesar who nobody found more jobs through Homeboy Industries than this guy Caesar. I knew him as a little kid, as a little mocosito growing up in the projects uh, in my parish. And uh, he got into a gang and then uh, there was a period of his life in the early 20s where I'd find him a job and then he'd uh, kind of gravitate back to vague criminality and then he'd get arrested and then he'd wander back to me again. It was a pattern. And he was kind of frustrating that way. He was a funny kid with a dangerous sense of humor. Well, this one time he had finished a stretch uh, like four months in probation, uh, excuse me, in uh, a probation violation in jail. And he appears and sits in front of me. And here we go again, you know. And he says what homies often say, this time it'll be different. I go, hmm. All right, so I pick up the phone, I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and right away he hires uh, Caesar right on the spot. Uh, and so he begins work the next day, but two weeks later, there he is again. He's sitting in front of my desk, and I thought, Híjole, Madre Santa, here we go again. But this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck, and he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me, and, and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, God, who? And he looked at me strangely, and he said, well, God, of course. Oh, yeah, no, that's right, yeah. That, that would be God, yeah. He said, you thought I was going to say you, didn't you? No, gosh, God's number one, yeah. <laughs> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days. He says, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now, he said. <laughs> well, we just fell out of our chairs and suddenly kinship so quickly but I defy you to identify exactly who is the service provider, who is the service recipient. It's mutual, and that's the place you want to get to. I never felt this more keenly than in my own life. Uh, it, uh, you know, I battled with health and uh, had leukemia and, and went through chemotherapy and, and uh, feeling pretty good, or as the homies uh, still say to me, I hear your cancer's in intermission. And I said, yes, it's apparently stepped out to the lobby to buy some popcorn. <laughs> May the line be long. Uh, but this news was announced on the front page of the Sunday LA Times, and so uh, homies came out of the woodworks, uh, and I would get uh, very touching sort of uh, voicemail messages, like a homegirl named Achina. She says, now it's our turn to take care of you. Very sweet. And then there was a homie named uh, Grumpy, six foot four, standing in front of my, my desk. A uh, huge guy with big tears in his eyes and apparently God had forgotten to give him a neck. And, and he says, what do I have that you need? You know, meaning organs. Um, I was so happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs, but it was, it was the thought that counted. Uh, one of my favorites was a little 15-year-old knucklehead gang member who uh, came late to this news. Uh, the homies would drive me to the hospital where I'd sit all day uh, getting my treatment. And, um, and they all wanted to drive me and pick me up. And now they think about it, I, that, that trip to and from the hospital was actually more harrowing than chemotherapy itself. But, uh, so this one time I came home and I just wanted to kick it in my office and this little guy came in little 15 year old knucklehead gang member and he plunks himself down and he looks positively stricken and he says I hear you have leukemia I said yeah and there was this awkward silence you know and my cat had leukemia <laughs> yeah 
she died. I said, oh gosh, I, I am so sorry to hear that. I'm awfully glad you stopped by though. It just picked me right up there. My all-time favorite was a homie who called me from jail, Collect, um, and he had just read this on the front page of the LA Times, and he said, hey, what's up with this leukemia anyway? I said, well, it's cancer, it's in the blood. The doctor says my white count's too high. Yes, and these doctors, they don't be knowing nothing. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, hello, of course your white count's high. So I just uh, 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 have called all my collect calls from jail a second opinion. And, but in the end, it's all kinship. It's all, we're in this together. So Homeboy Industries was born a long time ago when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. Uh, which at the time was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. Uh, at the time, we had eight gangs at war with each other, um, which was unheard of, and, and making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in all of Los Angeles happened to be my parish. I didn't know this. I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness uh, in 1988 and I buried my 183rd on Friday, a kid named Gonzalo, who was stabbed to death. And I knew him since he was 10 years old. So we did a lot of things. We started a school, um, a junior high uh, school, because there were so many middle school age kids gang members who uh, had been given the boot from their home school, nobody wanted them. So they were uh, wreaking havoc and violent in the, in the projects, selling drugs and such. So I walked out to them and I said, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And um, to my surprise, they all said yes. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. Uh, so we started a school at uh, Dolores Mission. Uh, called Dolores Mission Alternative, and that brought gang members to the church in large numbers. And so that uh, kind of challenged people because aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. And so that was a challenge. And then they said to us, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women in the parish, we marched all around the factories that surrounded the projects trying to find felony-friendly employers. And that wasn't so forthcoming. And so we couldn't wait. And so by 1992, we started a business, Homeboy Bakery. I got a, a movie producer to give me some money to buy this bakery, old abandoned bakery across the street from the church. And Homeboy Bakery was born. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, uh, we came up with the highfalutin homeboy industries as if there was any industry involved in this venture. Um, not everything worked, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing was really not a huge success, as I recall. Uh, who knew people didn't want gang members in their homes? I, I didn't see that coming. Um, and now, we didn't intend to become this, but we've backed our way uh, into becoming the largest a gang intervention rehab and reentry program in the country. 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to uh, find the services that Marcus and Edward have found. Uh, keep in mind there are 1,100 gangs in LA County, 86,000 gang members, so it's a pretty daunting and enormously complex social dilemma. So you name anything that might be helpful and we do it, we have uh, uh, a lot of curricular offerings from anger management to uh, grief and loss to yoga to GED. We still have a school. Um, we have Baby and Me, which I saw that on your flyer for the 8 o'clock gathering, so you'll hear all about Baby and Me from uh, your compadres who went there. Um, uh, anger ma uh, what, we have case managers, lots of them, mental health uh, team, everybody's in therapy. Uh, I think you mentioned all the things that we do. Uh, chips and salsas uh, that Marcos uh, runs. Um, 
employment uh, services where job developers locate employment uh, past uh, and beyond Homeboy in the private sector. Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, uh, the farmer's markets where uh, Edward works. Uh, we have 24 of those. Um, Homeboy Diner, which is the only place you can eat food at the City Hall in Los Angeles. We're about to have a restaurant open in the LAX uh, terminal, uh, American Airlines terminal uh, in Los Angeles. In Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude will gladly take your order, as I'm sure you discovered when you were out there. Um, one of my favorite uh, things that happened last, I think it was last year, maybe it was long ago, longer ago, uh, when uh, Oscar-winning actress uh, Diane Keaton showed up for lunch, she of Annie Hall, uh, Academy Award and Godfather movies, big movie star, she shows up and her waitress is Glinda. And um, Glinda is a home girl, been there, done that, tattooed, parolee, felon. She doesn't know who Diane Keaton is. So she's taking her order and she says, uh, Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? Since I've never been here before. And Glinda rattles off the three platillos that she really particularly likes. And then uh, Diane Keaton says, well, I have that second one. That, that one sounds good. And it's at that moment that something dawns on Glinda. She looks at her and she goes, wait a minute. I feel like I know you. You know, like maybe we've met somewhere. And Diane Keaton sort of deflects it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I, I have one of those faces, you know, that people think they've seen before. And then Glinda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> that just took my breath away when I, when I heard it. And I don't believe uh, we've had any further uh, Diane Keaton sightings now that I've heard of it. Uh, but suddenly kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and we need to look no further than what Jesus says in the gospel when he articulates exactly what is on God's mind. He says that you may be one. I suppose he could have been more self-referential, but it really is about us, that you may be one. Lately, uh, I've been taking a stroll, a leisurely stroll through the Acts of the Apostles, and I suppose you could read it as a quaint snapshot of the life of the earliest Christian community, or you could see it as the measure of the health of any community. See how they love one another, that's in there. There is nobody who is needing anything in our community, that's a good one. But the one that leapt off the page for me was this. And awe came upon everyone. Awe is the measure of our health as a community. Can we seek a compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? It was uh, maybe a couple years ago now that I, I traveled to Richmond, Virginia uh, to give a training to 600 social workers, a training on gangs. And I brought two homies with me, as I have today. Uh, Andre, who uh, brought uh, Edward into uh, Homeboy, and, uh, and another guy named Jose. And they helped me give this training because we had to fill the whole day, so they helped tell their story. And I hadn't heard their stories before. And Jose got up there, and he was in his uh, mid-20s, uh, a gang member, tattooed, been to prison. Uh, at the time, he was working in our uh, substance abuse department, which is quite large. We really help homies deal with their uh, drug addiction. He himself was... Uh, uh, a heroin addict and, and now very solidly in his recovery, uh, helping heal those who struggle with that. Uh, but he had been homeless and uh, uh, had a hard life. 
but I'd never heard his full story. So he gets up in sort of an offhanded way and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I guess I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, the whole audience gasped. And then he said, it sounds way worser in Spanish, he says, you know. Everybody laughed, we needed a laugh. Then he said, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California, and she walks me up to an orphanage. And she says, I found this kid. It was 90 days before my grandmother came to pick me up after she had gotten my mom to tell her where she had dumped me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt because the blood would seep through and the second t-shirt because you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, why are you wearing three t-shirts? It's 100 degrees. And then he got quiet, like he was seeing a part of his story that only he could see. And he began to choke back his tears, and he said, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see my wounds. And now my wounds are my friends. I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. After all, he says, how can I help the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. All of you are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, calls enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. You don't hold the bar up and ask anybody to measure up, you just show up and you hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth and it all happens to be the same truth, and here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch, in particular, people on the margins as they become that truth, as they inhabit that truth, and no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out, and death can't touch it, because it's huge. But you also know that occasionally you have to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way. The great scripture scholar Marcus Borg says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. And I think he's quite right. Just so that you know, you're not alone in uh, the fact that you were forced to read my book. It happens occasionally. And uh, whatever it was, last year, I think, uh, Gonzaga forced their freshmen to read my book. And that's my alma mater. So, of course, when they said, please come and speak, I agreed. And I brought, again, two homies with me. I always pick homies who um, I've never uh, traveled with before so you get to know each other. But I also pick homies who uh, haven't flown before, or at least 
haven't flown in a long time, maybe since they were little kids. But in all, I've, I've probably done this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times with homeboys and homegirls. Never in my life. I brought these two guys named Bobby and Mario. Mario was the most panicked, terrified flyer I've ever flown with. I mean, he was just he, he, hyperventilating, you know, and we hadn't even gotten on the plane yet, you know, so, so, uh, so we flew from Burbank, which is a kind of a smaller airport. I don't know if any of you have been in it. And it's smaller in Southwest Airlines. And, and you can see the plane come right up to the window. And there's no hermetically sealed chute. You walk out onto the tarmac, like the President of the United States, and you climb up those stairs to go through the front door or the back door. And so Mario is just completely terrified. And uh, so I say, oh, well, here's our plane, you know, and he's, and he's just so nervous and the plane arrives and it's early morning and I see two flight attendants females and they're carrying each of them carrying uh, very large cups of Starbucks coffee and they're clumping up the front steps it's morning they're our flight uh, crew and Mario goes when are we gonna board the plane and I, I point to the flight attendants I said well as soon as they sober up the pilot um, there they go now I know, I probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, I should tell you that Mario, um, uh, who doesn't work for me now, okay, people move on, but uh, at the time, he was about the most tattooed individual you've ever met. I don't know if you met him. He worked in the, uh, in the merchandise store. Just a tall drink of water, very skinny, but so tattooed, sleeved out his whole neck, his whole face, except for this little space here, everything was tattooed. And so I'd never been out in public with him. So I'm walking in the terminal and, and I'm watching people going like this and mothers are clutching their kids, you know. And I go, wasn't well, that curious? Because if you know him, he's about the kindest human being you ever would want to meet, the kindest, most gentle soul. Even as terrified as he was on the plane, you know, um, the flight attendant would hand him peanuts, you know, and, and he didn't just take them, and he didn't just thank her. He, he grabbed her hand, he looked her in the eye, and he says, thank you so much, with this kind of gentle, uh, effusive gratitude. But he was like that for the whole trip. So, um, you know, so we had the big talk like this one, and, um, but they, Gonzaga scheduled all these little talks, a whole bunch of them, like seven of them, in class, class, lunch, meeting, class, class, class. And I told these guys, I'm not going to talk at any of them. I'll talk at night. You go ahead and you tell your stories. And uh, they were a little nervous at first, but they, they got used to telling their stories, stories of great abandonment and having been thrown away as kids, stories of violence and torture and chaos. If their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. So the nighttime came and uh, we kind of reversed the order than what we did here. I spoke first and then each of them uh, spoke uh, a, a little bit so that we could include them in the question and answer period. And so uh, I gave my talk and Mario got up and he was a little nervous and then and Bobby got up and they were both very good. So uh, question and answer. So I open it up and there's a woman over here and she stands and she says, yeah, I have a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gate is for Mario. Well, he steps up to the microphone. He's just terrified more than the plane ride. Yes. And he looks at the woman and she goes, well, you say you're a father and you have a daughter and a son and they're both entering uh, teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what, what advice do you give them? And Mario stands in front of the microphone and he closes his eyes and he nearly herniates himself from coming up with the answer, but he wants to get the right answer. And before he can really formulate the whole sentence, he blurts out, I just... And then he catches himself and he can't speak. And then he says, I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. 
and there's a hush until the woman stands up the one who asked the question now her eyes are filled with tears and she can barely speak but she's very strong why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you you are loving you are kind you are gentle you are wise I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand people stand, and they will not stop applauding. A thousand strangers return Mario to himself, and the soul feels its worth. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands as he cries. And I think that's the only praise God has any interest in. One last story and I'll let you go. Or whatever it is that follows. Uh, people always ask me about enemies working together. Uh, a reporter uh, asked me that today. And um, it's tough at first, you know, homies will come in, and again, our program is not for those who need it, it's only for those who want it. And uh, so they'll come in and they'll say, uh, I'm ready. I'll say, okay, I have an opening at the bakery but you have to work with X, Y, and Z, and I rattle off the names of enemies, rivals. And homies always do the same thing. They always think for a long ass time, and then they, then they say, okay, I'll work with them, but I'm not gonna talk to them. You know, which used to bother me in the old days until you discover, of course, that it's impossible for human beings to demonize people they know. You, you just can't pull it off. So I uh, had a kid named Youngster. Everybody called him Youngster. That was his gang name. And I thought he was ready. So I bring him to the Homeboy Silkscreen Factory, which is our biggest business, been around for a long time. And I start to walk him through the floor of the factory and I introduce him to his coworkers. And I watch as Youngster, a little tiny guy, shakes hands with his enemies even, lots of enemies there, half of them probably, and he shakes their hands and he looks them in the eye and I think, wow, this is great. Until finally he gets around the bend to the last guy, a guy who seems to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether, a kid everybody called Puppet. And when Puppet and Youngster are in each other's vicinity, they mumble something, they stare at their shoes, they don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies, but they, he just finished shaking hands with other enemies. I discover later that um, this was a hatred that's really deep and personal, beyond which neither of them thought they could really get past. So I sensed that much at the moment, and I said, look, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I got a bunch of people who want this job and they don't say anything. Well, six months later, Puppet is going to a store some distance from his home, one of those little corner stores, and he purchases something, but on the way home, he decides to take a shortcut, so he cuts into an alley and because of this uh, detour, suddenly he's unexpectedly surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one, and they beat him badly, and he falls to the ground. And while he's lying there, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds him and takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead but they keep them connected to machines so that you, you can get two days of a flat read, no brain activity at all, and then after the 48-hour 
period, the doctors can sign the death certificate, making it official. This allowed family and friends to gather. Um, I was at St. Louis, Louis University giving a talk. I flew home. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, uh, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. It was horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the 48 hour period, I gave him a blessing prayer. I anointed his forehead with oil, con la unción de los enfermos. We disconnected. Then a week later, I buried him. But in the first 24 hours, while he was laying in the hospital, after he had just been beaten down, I was alone in my office. It was 8.30 at night. And the phone rings, and it's youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. Hey, he says, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it until finally he breaks the silence, choking back his tears, and he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy, he was my friend. We worked together. Now can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries? Yeah, of course. Any exceptions? No. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out It's mutual. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, we wait for it. Thank you all very much. That was the end. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And please remember, 8 o'clock, fifth floor, Brennan, are the discussions. Good night.